When the Buddha talks about the three kinds of fabrication, bodily, verbal, and mental, he does it in two contexts. One is in the context of describing how different actions lead to different levels of rebirth. In other words, fabrication on the macro level. He says if you fabricate an injurious, injurious bodily fabrication or verbal or mental fabrication, whether you're alert to it or not, in other words, alert to the intention behind it, alert to what you're doing, but the fact that there is an intention in there someplace means that you'll go to an injurious place. And on the other hand, if you fabricate these things in a non-injurious way, again, whether you're alert or not to what you're doing, you go to a non-injurious place. So the way we fabricate things, the way we act, the intentions we act on have huge consequences. The other context he talks about is in the context of meditation. Now here he defines fabrication not as actions in general, but very specific ones. For bodily fabrication, there's the breath, the in and out breath. Verbal fabrication, it's directed thought and evaluation, the way the mind talks to itself. And then in mental fabrication is perceptions and feelings. Feelings here are not so much emotions, they're feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. Now the way these things are defined, you realize that they don't happen only when you're meditating. It's not that you're going to do John and suddenly say, well, I've got to do some directed thought and some evaluation. The mind's doing this all the time, and of course we're breathing all the time. And the mind's dealing with feelings and perceptions all the time. But the Buddha is highlighting the fact that when you're meditating, you get to see these things really clearly, especially if the breath is the topic of your meditation. You're directing your thoughts to the breath. You're evaluating the breath. Does it feel good right now? What would feel better? Longer, shorter, faster, slower, deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter? And you try out different things. This is the way we act in lots of different circumstances, not only when we meditate. It's simply a matter of learning how to do it with more skill and more sensitivity. As for feelings and perceptions, the feeling of pleasure that you're trying to create with the breath. And the perceptions you have around the feelings and perceptions you have around the breath. These are going to have an impact on shaping your mind. And so what you've got here is a microcosm. These are the forces that are going to shape your the rest of your life and your future lifetimes, as long as you're continuing to wander on. They're right here. I read a scholar talking about how these two ways of explaining the three kinds of fabrication were totally unrelated, which is missing the point. How are you going to learn about the big processes unless you look at where they come from? And they come from the mind. That verse at the beginning of the Dhammapada, the mind is the forerunner of all things. Most people treat it as a nice sentiment, but they don't realize the implications. The way you shape your experience is going to determine your happiness, it's going to determine your suffering. And what do you shape it with? Bodily, verbal, mental fabrication. And these things are done both in response to events from outside, but more importantly, they go out looking for things, shaping things even before you've seen them, before you've heard them. Your mind is already inclined. And we see this most clearly in people with very strong doctrinaire political views. Person X says something and 
the people who hate person X already are going to find something wrong with it, regardless of what X says. And if Y says something and they like Y, then no matter how stupid Y can be, they still like him. It's because of the way they're already fabricating things before anything happens. Of course, this doesn't happen only in politics. We have certain attitudes about our feelings, our emotions. And so when a particular emotion comes up, we ride with it, even though it may be very detrimental. I mean, this is why we create suffering, because the mind is already biased. A particular impulse comes up, and for some impulses the way is wide open in the mind. For other impulses there are a lot of checks and a lot of obstacles. And sometimes it has very little to do with whether the impulse is skillful or not skillful. A lot of it has to do with things we like and don't like. But then our likes are very arbitrary. And that seeing them as fabricated is going to be a huge step in making it a lot easier to practice. You may hold on to a particular like, and you don't like it when people don't react well to your like. It takes a while to realize, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't like this, or maybe I shouldn't hold on to that particular preference in this particular circumstance. This is probably one of the reasons why the Buddha focuses on suffering. Because it's only when you see yourself creating suffering that you're willing to change your ways. Otherwise you just keep banging your head and complaining about the wall being in the way. Without thinking, maybe I should stop banging the, that, my head in that particular direction. But it's when you can see that you're creating the suffering, or at least willing to give that option a try. That's when you can be taught. So that's why the Buddha teaches right there, at the part where you're most susceptible to maybe wanting to listen. I was reading a book on the Eightfold Path a while back, where the author was saying that even the Buddha engaged in unskillful speech. Well, it turned out what this author meant by unskillful speech was saying things that people don't like. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with saying things that people don't like. The Buddha said, though, you have to watch for the right time and the right place. But the idea that people's likes should be the determining factor, it's creating a tyranny of emotions. Just because one person doesn't like what the Buddha is saying doesn't mean that what the Buddha said was not skillful. What made it skillful was that it was one, true, two, beneficial, and three, he would choose the right time and the right place to be pleasing or displeasing. That's a much higher standard, and that's a much more livable standard. Because if we take our likes and dislikes as the measurement of the world, we'll never come to any peace. You have to step back from them and ask yourself, well, these things that I like, do they really lead to happiness? The things that I don't like, do they really lead to suffering? And John Swab would often point out one very obvious example. We don't like suffering. We treat it as an enemy, so we should learn how to treat it as a friend. Not the kind of friend where you can let down your guard, but the kind of friend that you want to spend some time with to get to know this person. We take craving as our friend, and that's our enemy. It's under the force of craving that we do all kinds of harmful things. And then we don't even admit that there was any harm done. 
or if there was harm done, we didn't mean to or we weren't responsible, or the person was har who was harmed doesn't matter. All kinds of ways the mind can justify harmful behavior to itself because it likes it. So we have to learn how to step back from our likes and dislikes. Step back from our cravings. And the emotions that cover up the cravings. And really look at them. And say, maybe it's time to try measuring ourselves against the Buddhist standard rather than measuring him against ours. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about the stages in going from looking for a teacher to finally gaining awakening. Trying to find the right person, then learning how to listen to what that person has to say, thinking it through. And then there comes a stage that the Buddha calls measuring or putting in the balance. And basically what you're doing is you're putting your habits and likes and dislikes in the balance against the Buddhist standards. And you're willing to use his standards to measure your likes and dislikes. That's when he says you begin to get a sense of having a desire to practice. And you find that you benefit a lot more from the Dharma when you do. We chant every night, Swakato Bhagavata Tammo, every night, every morning. The Blessings One's Dharma is well taught. And this is what it means. It's worthy of taking as a standard, even in areas where you don't like it. Because otherwise we keep on fabricating in lots of unskillful ways. And we bring our preconceived notions and we bring our prejudices and our biases and our likes and dislikes to everything that happens, everything that comes to us, and everything we go out, to looking, go out looking for. And everything gets skewed as a result. We look at a line it doesn't look straight. Well, maybe it's because the glasses we're wearing have a curve. Turn everything that is straight into something that's curved. Maybe it's time we took off those glasses. And give the Buddha the benefit of the doubt. After all, people for many, many centuries have been finding, yes, the Buddha's Dharma is well taught. Nobody said that about our likes and dislikes, that they're well formulated. We're the only ones who think that way. It's one of the reasons why we suffer. So it's good to step back. Look at this process of fabrication. Look at the way you breathe. Look at the way you talk to yourself. Look to the feelings, in other words, feeling tones you hold on to. Look at the perceptions you hold on to. And remember these simple things that are happening right here, right now. You're engaging in them right here, right now. They can have huge consequences. And the heedful response. And the response that has goodwill for yourself and those around you is to decide that you want to do these things skillfully. Taking the Buddhist standards for what counts as skillful as your, as your measurement. At the very least, give it a try. <laughs>